Hey, what is up guys? In today's video, we're gonna build the best gaming PC under $500 that you can get in early 2021. Now, as usual, we're gonna go over the whole building process step by step from start to finish and we're then going to fire up this PC and we're going to look at what kind of frame rate or FPS you can expect in case you decide to build this PC. Now, if you find anything you like, all items are linked up down below. Now for around $400 for this PC build, you will be able to play a lot of games in 60fps at 720p. For example, we're averaging between 45 to 60fps in Call of Duty Warzone. With that being said, in some titles, you're even gonna be able to crack the resolution to 1080p while still averaging 60fps. Pretty impressive numbers knowing that we're only spending $400 for this entire PC build. Anyway, inside this computer we find an AMD Ryzen 3 3200G processor. This is a high clocked 4 core APU that is based on AMD Zen Plus and Vega graphics architecture. So you're getting a graphics card plus a CPU that is capable of running most games with respectable frame rate. All in one package for just around $99. Now to get as much gaming performance out of the APU, we're gonna pair it with 16GB from Corsair. And I recommend going for RAM sticks with 3200MHz. And that is what we are testing out today. And just a quick look at Valorant running at 1080p low settings. We're averaging over 80 FPS. If you want to go for the competitive frame rate, you can drop the resolution down to 720p and you will see around 130 FPS on average. Now for the rest of our system, we find a 500GB M.2 SSD. Everything contained inside this Fantex case. Anyway guys, timestamps yeah, can be found down below. Now before we get started, be sure to drop a comment, let me know what you thought about the video, drop a like if you enjoy the content, and make sure to subscribe to never miss an episode. So let's get started with the motherboard, and I chose the Gigabyte B450M DS3H because of two reasons. For one, it is extremely reliable, and I've been using this board for plenty of my past PC builds without ever running into a single problem. The second reason I chose this board is that it comes with everything you'd expect, plus a few extra features that'll make the motherboard a bit more future proof. For example, we find 4 DIMM slots with dual channel support, so you can add another 16GB of RAM if you want later on. We find 8 USB ports, 4 SATA ports, as well as an M.2 slot plus an HDMI and a DVI for display output. And since we're not going to plug in a dedicated graphics card in this PC, we're gonna use these ports to hook up our monitor later. So before you decide whether to build this PC, you wanna double check that your monitor either has an HDMI or a DVI port. So let's talk about the processor super quickly. So I chose the Ryzen 3 3200G. It has 4 cores and 4 threads with the base clock at 3.6 and the 4 GHz turbo. This 4 core APU offers fantastic gaming performance for its price tag and it can run many modern games and upcoming games at 720p. But in a lot of cases, you'll even be able to run your favorite game at 1080p with low settings and good frame rate. And in case you decide to upgrade with the dedicated graphics card later on. You can expect pretty good frame rates here without the CPU becoming too much of a bottleneck. As we can see, our motherboard comes with a retention frame pre installed, but since we're using a cooler with springs, we need to remove the retention frame from the motherboard, and we do so by removing the four screws holding it in place. With the retention frame gone, ensure that the backplate remains in position with the holes on the motherboard. So let's install the processor and this is actually quite simple. You want to locate this golden triangle on the processor and this triangle lines up with the corresponding triangle on our motherboard socket. You want to turn the CPU so that the triangles match up, open the metal arm, drop the processor into the socket, put the metal arm down and our CPU is now installed. Now there is a heatsink that is included in the box which is actually pretty good for stock settings but if you want to overclock your APU you're gonna need something better. Now overclocking your APU is very easy and you can expect to gain between 3 to 8 FPS on average in your favorite game with this PC. Now in case you want to try overclocking I'm 
linking up a great budget CPU cooler for that. However, the included stock cooler is actually more than enough if overclocking isn't your cup of tea. Now, the cooler installment is pretty simple. Now, if this is the first time installing the CPU cooler, it should have some thermal grease pre applied, and in that case, you don't need to apply thermal grease on the CPU lid first. Position the CPU cooler so that the four spring screws on the heatsink align with the four holes on the back plate, and once aligned, carefully place the heatsink onto the CPU. Then turn each spring screw half a turn clockwise to ensure the spring screw makes a connection with the back plate. Follow a diagonal pattern across the CPU cooler, further tightening each spring screw with the full turn. And with all four spring screws connected to the back plate, tighten them until you feel resistance. Then check the CPU cooler to ensure that it's uh, properly secured to the motherboard. One thing to not forget is to connect the fan power cable to the CPU cooler to the fan, uh, CPU fan header to the motherboard. Next up, we're gonna need some memory, and for today's build, we're gonna go with these 16GB Vengeance LPX RAM sticks from Corsair. Now, 16GB is actually more than enough for modern gaming. Now, our APU will actually borrow 4GB that will be shared with the GPU units, so that will effectively leave us with 12GB for our system, which, yeah, is still perfectly good enough for gaming in 2021. Alright, so our motherboard supports something called the Dual channel, and in order for this to work, we're gonna populate the gray slot. So simply pull back the toggle for the second and the fourth dim slot, and simply plug them in just like so. All right, so time to install our M.2 drive. So we want to locate the M.2 slot, which we find right underneath the CPU cooler. And so what we want to do now is we want to loosen this tiny screw just like so. Then gently slide the M.2 unit into the socket with the little notch on the opposite side of the CPU cooler just like so. Finally, we take that little screw like so and we hold it down and we screw it down until it stops. Now it is finally time to take our motherboard assembly if you like and move it inside our chassis. And in today's build we're gonna use the Fantex Eclipse P350X coming in at $69. This is a mid-tower case that comes with two addressable RGB LED strips at the front and another one right underneath the temper glass side panel. Now Fantex has done a fantastic job with the P350X. It definitely feels premium, it's got plenty of expandability and this is Subjective of course, but it's also very nice to look at, at least in my opinion. Inside this we find a 120mm fan pre-installed, and here is what the system sounds like in a typical gaming session. So first thing we're gonna do now is to prep the case, and the first thing we wanna do is we wanna take off these uh, thumb screws holding the tempered glass. Next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna install our IO shield that we find inside the motherboard box. This goes in from the back of the case with the circular audio ports located at the bottom. And with the CPU cooler installed, we can just grab on to the CPU fan and slide the motherboard into place. And this can be done uh, by either having the case standing up or laying down down and I actually prefer having it laying down. We need to secure the motherboard using the motherboard screws that comes provided from Fantex and with the motherboard installed and secured before we install our power supply and storage, now it's a good time to connect the chassis cables that takes care of front audio and USB as well as the power button. So let's start with USB 3. This is a wide connector and it's almost impossible to miss. Simply route it through one of the various routing holes and plug it in. The connector is located down at the bottom of the motherboard. Next up is the front audio and this cable goes to the left side corner. Lastly we find this tiny front panel connector and you find and you find a spot where to install this on the lower right side. This one can be a bit tricky guys but just take your time and be careful and everything should be just fine. Alright, so it is time to install our power supply and for today's build we are gonna go with the Corsair CV450 despite this being the 550. I actually found out that Amazon is selling the 450 for 
uh, 55 bucks now you can obviously go for the 550 coming in at 58 dollars or you can save a few dollars and go for the 450 that is entirely up to you guys both are gonna work perfectly fine for this pc build however if you want to upgrade to a graphics card later down the road i recommend going for the cv 550 Anyway, this is a high quality power supply from Corsair that has an 80 plus bronze efficiency certification. Make sure you got the fan facing downwards, then gently slide the power supply uh, into place and secure it. Now, a couple of cables we're gonna need here. First up is the 24 pin power for the motherboard. Next up is the 8 pin power for our CPU, and this one goes all the way up to the top left side corner. And now we have reached the point where we typically install a graphics card but since our graphics chip is actually built into our processor we can just skip this step and the only thing left is to flip the case around whack on the side panel and we have officially completed our 400 dollars gaming pc build and if you did everything right and followed me step by step your system should also power on so let's fire up some games guys and find out how this PC performs. Oh, also guys, I almost forgot, first time you're booting up the system, make sure to double check that the RAM sticks are running in its XMP profile. And we're doing this by uh, tapping delete while we're seeing the Gigabyte logo. We then head over to the overclocking session, we select profile 1 and we are now good to go. So we're starting with Valorant at 1080p low settings and this results in about 80 FPS on average. But if you're willing to drop the settings down to 720p, you can expect upwards 150 FPS. Next up is CSGO and here we're looking at 1080p with competitive settings and this gives us an average FPS of well over 130 FPS. Whereas in 720p you're gonna see frame rates above 200 FPS. Far Cry New Dawn however falls a bit behind and this has much to do with the game engine where we know that this one likes cores and threads and this is where CPUs like the 3200G who only got 4 cores can actually bottleneck the performance. Division 2 is up next and here we see a much healthier numbers almost 50 FPS and at 1080p and so if you do a little bit of overclocking here you're gonna see numbers close to the magic 60 fps mark shadow of the tomb raider we saw almost 60 fps in 720p and about 35 fps in 1080p so almost 50 percent reduction going from 1080p to 720 which yeah is a bit of a disappointment for sure grand theft auto 5 however runs great on our system with over 70 fps at 1080p and almost 100 fps at 720p which is just fantastic knowing that we're only spending $99 for this APU while Rosette also runs great with almost 60 FPS in 1080p Fortnite also runs great as we can see and I went with a mix between low and competitive settings here and so viewing distance is set to 4 and 3D model is set to 70 to 80 percent and this results in about 60 FPS on average and this is at 1080p however if you decide to drop the settings to the lowest you're gonna see numbers close to the three digit mark for 1080p and about 150 fps and 720p apex legends also runs great if you're willing to drop the settings down to 720p 1080p might also be possible if you do some overclocking and speaking of overclocking guys if you go for a beefier cpu cooler with just a few clicks I was actually able to reach over 60 FPS in World War Z and I gained about 8 FPS in Division 2 so this is definitely something worth considering. Anyway going back to stock settings in Devil May Cry 5 we're averaging over 80 FPS at 720p and 43 FPS at 1080p. Hitman 2 is another game that runs quite good on our system with almost 50 FPS at 720p. PUBG also runs great at 720p and even Resident Evil 2 can be played on our system at this resolution. 
And again guys, all components we just went over can be found down below. Now I am starting up a Discord server and it would mean the world to me if you guys wanted to join. And here we can discuss PC builds and issues and everything in between. Now I'm going to hang out here and answer any questions you guys might have. So you definitely want to join up. Now watch either of these two videos and I will see you guys in the next video.